So welcome everybody to this um, very special seminar, part of the History at Newcastle seminar series. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, our speaker today, Professor Rosemary Orkbeady from the University of Reading. Um, now I'm sure most of you have put two and two together and realised that <laughs> Professor Rosemary Orkbeady is in fact the daughter of the first Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle, Professor James Orkbeady. So we're very pleased to have you here in Cultural Collections at the, uh, in the Orkney Library at the University of Newcastle to give your paper today. Now I'm just going to briefly hand over to Jude Conway because it's thanks to Jude that we've managed to, um, to, to have Rosemary here with us today. Um, and Jude's going to talk a little bit about why Rosemary's in Newcastle and then we'll, we'll get on with the proceedings. So thank you. Hi everyone. Um, and welcome to Rosemary Orkney. So Rosemary was uh, a born internationalist, and um, we've just heard why she came to Newcastle. She was born in Egypt. She, her father was Irish, her mother was American, and then they came to Australia. And uh, her father got a job at the fledgling University College at Newcastle. He was a historian as well. So this year, 1967 at Newcastle Girls High, known as Girls High in Newcastle, <laughs> um, we finished high school. So this weekend there's um, reunions happening Saturday and Sunday, so I thought I'd grab Rosemary. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd had a bit of a look at what she'd been up to for a talk I gave at a Girls High reunion. And this was one of the papers she gave. Now, what is it, Rosemary? Um, marriage. Married the law and feminism. How marriage lost its ability to oppress women. I thought mm, I like the sound of that paper. And Rosemary is also a walking example of cross disciplinary discipline. She was has a PhD in history. She started out as a historian and some of her early work in Australia was very feminist orientated. This is for high school students, uh, Australian, looking at the situation of women, 1978. Um, it has that picture in without the purple circle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can put. <laughs> and then she went to uh, London, and if you want to know more about um, why she went over to England, you would have to come to our reunion tomorrow, because she's giving the talk. And, um, so, but she didn't come to Newcastle Uni, she went to ANU. <laughs> <laughs> it was a risk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm really looking forward to her talk, and um, Kate's going to tell you more about her talk. And what I particularly like about Rosemary's stan uh, stance is that feminist, that activist uh, attack in all the areas of work that she does and in her areas of gender and sexuality. And we're just so very glad to have you here, Rosemary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the slide's over. I'll just give you a bit of background. Um, so Jude's already mentioned Rosemary's respect <coughs> interests into um, feminist histories and women's history. Uh, gender and sexuality, but Rosemary's also done work on children's literature, um, legal education and property law, and her paper today, or her presentation today, comes out of a current research project um, into feminist legal history and biography uh, that is part of the forthcoming centenary celebrations of the admission of women um, into the legal profession in the UK. So 2019 will be the centenary. Um, so I'll pass over to Rosemary now. <coughs> well, thank you for the two warm welcomes. Thank you, Jude and Kate, for setting this up. Um, you can imagine what a thrill it is for me to be here. Kind of bizarre seeing my father's photograph around. Um, it's lovely. Oh, it's always lovely to come back to Newcastle because I was very, very happy growing up here, going to school here. And I didn't actually like the ANU very much, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say, I know. Um, but, you know, it wasn't Newcastle. And uh, so, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about I, this doing women's legal history because, as Kate explained, I. I Basically, I teach property law and I teach gender and law, 
Um, and as Jude explained, I started off as a historian. And towards the end of my career, I was able to put together um, my interest in history and my interest in law. And particularly because of the project, the forthcoming, uh, well, there are many projects that have been set up to celebrate the forthcoming centenary of the admission of women to the legal profession in the UK and Ireland, which happened in 1919, so it's coming up in 2019. Um, also, there are some projects for women and the vote. That happened in 1918 in uh, the UK. Um, and a lot of these projects, I, actually I've got a, a little list of some of the projects that are on at the moment. The first 100 years projects are um, a group of lawyers in the UK and Ireland, and they're kind of doing researching their first 100 years and interviewing lawyers, and they've got a very smart website, and they hold events and so on. Um, the first woman lawyers in Great Britain and the Empire set up by a student of mine, ex-student of mine, now an academic, and uh, she gets people from all over the world coming in and giving papers. She's had three symposiums altogether, and there are two more to come. Women's Legal Landmarks is the one that I'm coordinating with a friend of mine called Erica Rackley, who's a very distinguished legal scholar, young, you know, half my age and brilliant, um, who asked me to, to join in this. And we've got a group of, I'll talk more about this, this later, but about 100 people each writing a landmark, and it's going to come out as a big book on the website. Um, all to celebrate 1919. The Gender and Careers and Legal Academy is an international thing that's organised by a German friend of mine, um, and it's got people from all over the world, including some Australians and uh, Americans, Asian, uh, from, from everywhere, Africa, um, as well as Europe, who are looking at uh, women in the Legal Academy, so the first women law lecturers, law professors, and also the situation of women in the Legal Academy today. And this narratives of women in law is the thing I'm going to be part of next week at the ANU when I go down to the ANU and this Margaret Thornton and Heather Roberts are putting on um, something and, and they're very distinguished scholars who write about, well the lawyers will all know this, um, but they do historical work as well and they do contemporary work around the Legal Academy and the Judiciary, women in law generally. So those are just some of the things that are going on and in a way that was the spur for the work that I'm now doing on legal, um, women's legal history and biography because one of the things I discovered is that particularly for scholars who are educated in Europe, um, most legal academics have only done law. They haven't got another discipline the way it's much more common in Australia and certainly in the US um, to have another discipline or perhaps to have a first degree in something else. But for legal ac academics in... Um, certainly in the UK and in, in, on the continent generally. They're mostly only educated in law. And legal education has a particular way of approaching scholarship, which is not good for studying history at all, and <coughs> certainly for women. First of all, the whole idea of gender in law is much more recent um, in, in the legal academy, uh, gender in, at all, as a, as a concept that's important to scholarship. Much more recent in law than it was in history. I mean, in history, even when I did my PhD, which this was on women, even when I was an undergraduate, women's studies was just coming in and people were doing things around women and then moved on to gender. So these debates in history at least are 40, 50 years old. But in law, they're much more recent, probably only 20, in, certainly in Europe. Um, so that's one problem. It's not as sophisticated, the discussion. And it's still possible to go through a law degree as, in fact, normal without ever touching on gender at all. Our students don't have to do it. It's not compulsory. It might be, there might be an option if you're lucky, but it doesn't come into your ordinary legal studies. Um, the other thing about, another thing about um, legal scholars is they're trained only to, to look at legal sources. It's a very self-referential discipline because only legal sources have authority. Um, I mean, for a time, even parliamentary debates didn't have authority. Lots of other, I mean, it's changing, but it's very much that legal scholars don't know what's out there. They're not aware of what's out there that historians know. I, they, they'll, they'll look, they'll find the primary sources, but what constantly amazes me is they're just not aware that historians have actually mined all this territory, that actually they can find out about the period, they can locate what they're doing in secondary sources that exist. So that's another thing. The positivist approach of the kind of education that most of us have, positivism is kind of where the law is the law and you find it and you apply it, that's what we teach our students to do. Um, and of course you must follow the statute, you must follow the precedent, that you can't 
decide that this is fairer or something. It, it makes them unaccustomed to treating law as just a primary source, which historians will understand it's just a document, just something that's produced at a particular time by a particular body or person for a particular reason. Right? That it's that these are things that are susceptible, susceptible of critique. At a, it's not that people don't criticise judgments, they do, but basically they accept that that is the law. And there are some people who don't like it when, a lot of legal scholars actually, I'm just thinking about, um, I had to review a, a proposed um, property law textbook, land law textbook, which was good in lots of ways, but it was just awful on this, in that any judge who tried to take into account social factors or think that it was unfair for women, was just deviating from the law. And the, student, the students were being taught this, and so of course I read a very critical review, which wasn't very helpful for the publisher, <coughs> although they thanked me for my frankness. But, and, <laughs> and the other thing is, when you do do legal history, because legal history is taught, um, and of course I can't speak for Australian law schools, but, but in England it's taught in most law schools, but it's taught in a very sort of institutional top-down way, way, and it's mostly written that way, by which I mean you'll get a history of the legal profession, or a history of a certain courts or something like that, but it, it's, it's from the top, which means that you're not actually, your sources are then only the institutional sources and you're not looking beyond it, and I'll explain in a minute why I think that's a mistake. So I don't think legal scholars do it very well, is my point. Some of them do it brilliantly. But it seemed to me um, that really it was important for us if we were involved in these sorts of projects of rediscovering women, rewriting women's history, putting women back into legal history, that we should do it properly. And one of the big problems is this whole thing, historians again will be familiar with this notion, the Whig tradition. This is the idea that history is the tale of progress, from barbaric whenever it was you're comparing it with, which actually might even be when I was growing up with my students. Um, but you know, the 19th century or whenever it is, that has just been a tale of gradual progress, a few setbacks, but generally up to present equality and diversity or whatever the jargon is at the moment. So our students mostly do think that we are living in a world of equality and diversity. Mostly law schools are, of course, like that. So, you know, they, they don't quite realise until they go into the legal profession. So there's this whole idea, and this is long ago trashed by, in history. I mean, no one writes this sort of history anymore, at least I hope they don't. Historians will correct me, but... It's still common. It's not only common amongst legal historians, but it's something that a lot of the people who are involved in the projects that I'm involved in have imbibed from childhood. So you can see what this is an American scholar, uh, Susan Safe, is very good on, on legal history. And she says, because it's been usually been done by judges and law professors, involved in a system which society requires to produce articulate defences of the justice and rightness of current institutions, Legal history has mostly been celebratory, explaining how law was more, and beauti more beautifully adapted to the needs of society, more and more reflective of absolute justice. So, of course, those sorts of histories would say, well, in 1919, women are admitted to the legal profession, and it's been great ever since. That kind of story, right? And I put in there, note, the, the, the current um, focus on equality. Now, the way it works out with biographies, because certainly with the Women's Legal Landmarks, we have both landmarks which are particular statutes or cases which advance women's situation. We've also got people writing first women biographies, so this is the first woman judge, this is the first woman this, that, and the other, right? Is that my generation, at any rate, if we ever learnt anything about women's history at school, it was the kind of great heroines of history, like Florence Nightingale, like always Florence Nightingale or someone else, you know, Marie Curie, I think might have been one of them, you know, who, against the odds, because, of course, she was a woman in a man's world, had nevertheless achieved all these wonderful things. And the message is, of course, if you're like her, and they're nearly always beautiful. I mean, you had to be feminine as well, okay? So marriage and children is always a good thing, as long, you know, you can have a career as long as you do it the right way. I mean, in, in Florence Nightingale, of course, okay, she didn't have marriage, and, um, but she did, um, she did, uh, she did set up a profession of, for women that was in the service of the patriarchy, so that made the career sort of acceptable in her case. So, you know, there's got to be some kind of excuse, but basically these stories were there for girls to think, well, she could do it, I can do it too. These are the, the you know, this is what we should aspire to being. And of course, it's not like that. But do you know something? 
when women are writing, particularly with some of these, the first hundred years projects or something, they'll find some early woman lawyer. They'll say, well, you know, when she went to law school, she was the only person, the only woman in, in this all male law school. And then she went in to the law firm and they discriminated against her terribly. And now she's a high court judge and she's got this and she's got that and she's got, you know, honours from the Queen. And there's nothing in between. So what you're not getting here is you're just getting this story that by her, and then there'll be something about a supportive husband or, a, you know, who helped the child with the child care or something. And then there'll be something about um, maybe a mentor, a male mentor, some judge or someone helped, you know. And, and so you see a bit of how she got there, but actually what you don't see, and this is what I think is really important with biography, is, you know, how do women get from here to there? Because it's that narrative, which is not a straightforward narrative like this at all. Um, and it isn't just about your family background or your male helpers or whatever it is. It's, you know, that's what women's lives are like. And I think it's one of the things I've found really difficult because I brought some of the things with me for the, uh, the Gender and, and the Legal Academy um, project. I'm reading people's contributions from all over the world. And it's very interesting how they'll interview people and the, all these stories come out just written like that. Just written like that. And what you're not getting is the truth. Um, what you're not getting, I mean, not even that you can find the truth. You're not even getting the right questions being asked. Even if they don't know the answers, they're not, they're not writing, um, asking the questions. So a bit more about legal history. The way it's taught is incomplete. It favors certain actors in history. And guess what? They're powerful men. Um, women are in law. <coughs> so for example, if you want to do a history of women in law, um, they start at the point when women are admitted to the legal profession without looking at what women were doing before then. Or, what's more important to me, why they weren't lawyers before then. What was it about the men that they couldn't bear to have the women, that they opposed the women's entry? That's always skated over. And women have been trying to enter the legal profession in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same everywhere, for 50 or 60 years. You know, there have been court cases, there have been campaigns, there have been bills in Parliament, etc. None of that's discussed. Okay. Or they're only mentioned where they suit the tale of progress and this trust because I teach property law. All equity books start with, um, and land law books, with a historical chapter and it's all, you know, about feudalism and growth of these other courts and the king and all this sort of stuff. And so the trust, it's wonderful because it helped married women. Well, they never said, why did the position of married women need ameliorating? What was wrong with it? Well, of course, what was wrong with it was when you got married, your property went to your husband, which might have been nice if you had a nice husband. And it wasn't nice if you didn't. Um, so you didn't have independence. None of that ever discussed. Just always upwards and onwards, you know. It's Okay, and the other thing that, that these, the way in which legal history has been written doesn't do is it doesn't talk about the role that women played in bringing about legal change. So. Reforms benefiting women are always described, this is legal text, but I am not talking about work by professional historians, which is obviously, um, which is usually much more critical, but is not always a sound on the law, because, just because law is actually quite hard to understand. But anyway, they're always described as resulting from changed social attitudes, and I won't allow my students to use this expression at all, because of course, changed social attitudes, yeah, well, what changed them, okay? Things don't change without a whole lot of campaigning and publicity and all sorts of, you know, change actually in material conditions and so on. The people in the campaigns that help to bring about the changes are rarely named or their contributions down, downplayed. It's inaccurate, but of course it's there for a political purpose, to show that, in, uh, that our legal institutions are capable of reforming themselves when necessary, even though it takes them centuries to do so. So reforms are always due to enhanced social consciousness, enlightened and benevolent lawmakers, mm -hmm. increased deservingness of the hitherto subordinate group. I mean, for example, why did women get the vote? Well, they were so good in the First World War, mm -hmm. you know? And we certainly learned that at school because we did learn the British history. And I remember a, a, that the suffragettes were really, they damaged their cause. That's the way it was presented in our history textbooks at school because really they made, you know, fools of themselves. Um, never the agency of the group itself, and the reason why reform is needed is never because of oppression by the dominant. Never, ever, ever. But of course, in patriarchal society, women are very aware of that. And I've got a couple of examples. This one, 
from um, Manchester's Modern Legal History was a kind of textbook that was used. It's been used, I mean, it's 1980, but it's been used right up to the present. After the First World War and the dramatically changed role which women played during the course of that conflict, society began to take a radical, see, change social views, a radically different view of women's proper role in society. So it's kind of disembodied its society as a group, right? In 1919, the Law Society itself resolved that women might be admitted to the profession. <coughs> Great, they have reformed themselves in response to this need. Ignoring the fact that, and I wrote an article about a woman called Miss Bebb who challenged them you know, a good um, decade before, challenged the Law Society, and they said, no, women can't be uh, solicitors because they've never been lawyers. And here's another one, which I like this. This is an earlier book. Um, this Gentleman of the Law is a history of the bar. It's a good title, isn't it? I mean, in 1960, there had been women barristers then for like 40 years, but nevertheless, it's called gentlemen. <laughs> and so he says, in opposing the admission of women to their ranks, solicitors were doing little more than following current ideas on the inequality of the sexes. Okay, It's not their fault. That's how people thought then. It's very much what our students think. That's how people thought then. But the next bit, this episode has left no mark on the profession and merely serves to illustrate the solicitor's cautious and sometimes hostile attitude to change. It has no, left no mark on the profession. Anyone who has researched the legal profession knows that the uh, gaining of admission was the beginning of the struggle for women, not the end. It was the beginning of a struggle where they weren't wanted, they were, there weren't you know, anti-discrimination laws in those days, so they just didn't get jobs, they didn't get work, uh, they weren't promoted, they didn't go to the bench, they didn't do any of these things. So it was actually very hard, and a lot of women have written about this. So those are the sort of classic views that we get. And then, of course, you get this idea that the gaining of formal equality is uncritically equated with substantive equality. And that's a big problem for our students, because they do have formal equality, and they don't realise it until they go out into the bad world, a lot of them. Um, but they won't have substantive equality in the profession at all. It's still not very family friendly. It's still very hard for women in the legal profession in England. Um, alternative possible solutions go unmentioned. So actually what the feminists wanted might not have been what they got. Married women's property, a classic example. Feminists fought for married women's property rights in the 19th century. And the reform they got was not what they wanted. It wasn't that married women didn't hold property the same way as men did. They were very restricted. Um, and of course, the fact that most women didn't have any property to hold anyway was, was irrelevant. Married women weren't largely allowed to work, um, certainly if, in the professions, with a few exceptions. OK, and then the final thing, the dif differential effect on different social groups is ignored. I put in the civil partnerships because, as Jude mentioned, I've done quite a bit of work on on marriage and same-sex marriage as well. Very topical for you lot. Um, and civil partnerships is what we had before same-sex marriage. It is identical, legally identical with same-sex marriage, but they couldn't bring themselves to call it that. Okay. And when there was a big lot of campaigning about this, I mean, I wrote on this because as an old second-wave feminist, you know, I can't imagine why anyone wants to embrace marriage. Um, <laughs> and I did think that, that a lot of people who were embracing it were being very uncritical about it. And uh, Really, they, everyone wanted equality. We all want equality. That's right. But what actually were they taking on in terms of the law? And then I did a project where I went and interviewed people who dissolved their civil partnership, who got divorced. And some of them were just astonished at what marriage does in terms of what happens to their property and the fact they have to share it with their ex-partner and so on. Because they'd never thought about the fact that marriage is a legal institution. It isn't just a status. And of course, it worked. civil partnerships work better for men because in general, men are better off, so the tax advantages work for them. They work less well for women, because in general, women certainly, in fact, were less well off. They often had children, and so where before they'd had two sets of benefits, say, because they were viewed as single people, they suddenly found themselves coming down to one set of benefits. They were actually poorer. So a lot of people who campaigned for this discovered they were worse off as a result of it, because they just hadn't thought about the law. Okay, so what legal scholars can bring to history, understanding of the institutions, the personnel, the methods and processes, it is an arcane subject. I mean, I wrote a PhD 
a, you know, a thousand years ago in history where I did talk about law and I knew nothing. I mean, I was hopeless. I did say, oh, well, then women got the right to and that was, you know, I really did do all this stuff. It was the end of the story. Um, once you start looking into the, the ramifications of law, um, it's much more nuanced, I think, than many historians. But that's not true of all historians. There's some very good legal historians who are not themselves lawyers. But we can critique statute. I mean, you can find the statutes in case law, which you know, used to be difficult to find before the internet. Um, and this bit about the recognition that legal reform is not the end of the story. OK, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Women's Legal Landmarks project. And I'm going to, at the end, give you an example of what, what we're doing and how we're trying to action, if you like, this new way of looking at legal history. So as I pointed out, um, it's to celebrate the forthcoming centenary of the admission to women's, uh, of women to the legal profession in the UK and Ireland, which were all one country, of course, um, in, 20, in 1919. The collaborative project is a particularly feminist way of working, um, and it's been used for a lot of other things, feminist judgment. Yes, of course, I don't mind men being in it. Don't worry, I'll see the comments at the back. We do have some men. <laughs> But it's a way, it's, it's sharing, basically, and this has got a hundred people, including a couple of men, and we get together, um, we have workshops, and we critique each other's work, we read each other's work, and it's much better than saying, okay, you do this one, and you send it in to me, and I edit it, you do this one, and send it in, and edit it. It's really very much a sharing of knowledge, and that's great, it does lead to a much richer, richer outcome. Um, we also wanted to fill the gaps, if you like, because it's not part of mainstream legal history. And if we do this project, and there are books and there are websites, then people can find it. Everyone can find it. The public can find it as well on the website. We wanted to expose the lack of objectivity in most mainstream scholarship. And that is actually, as Jude said, that's my life, my life goal, really, is to expose the lack of objectivity. So I've tried to engender, as they say property law and all sorts of things. I've just edited a textbook which is for called Great Debates in Gender and Law, which takes every subject that's taught in law school, like taught and contract and so on, and puts gender into it because most law lecturers will think contracts have nothing to do with gender. Anyway, and then to develop feminist legal history, this whole methodology of feminist legal history um, in the UK where it doesn't exist. And so what does feminist legal history mean? It asks the woman question. Historians are familiar with this. Um, which means you have any event or any act or that's passed or any case, and then you say, where are the women? How does this affect the women? What would they do? You foreground gender as an organising principle in society um, and the dynamic. Gender, not gender in terms of sex, although it does mean that, of course, or, or your social role. Gender in terms of the relationship between men and women. Okay, it's a relationship. And so you look at that relationship. It focuses on women's agency rather than social attitudes. It focuses on law, which um, a lot of history has not. And this bit, that whenever you have these landmarks, because there is a danger, it appears as a weak history. These are all landmarks. That we have a little section that says, what happened next? So here was a landmark, and women got this, and it's really great. But guess what? The courts then came in and limited it. And well, the Abortion Act is a good example. You know, it's constant attempts. I think there have been hundreds of attempts. I heard at the SLS conference last week in Dublin to limit um, to limit the, the rights that women won in, in, the abortion, in the abortion law. Okay, so the process, we called for expressions. That's another thing. We didn't allocate landmarks. People chose their own. So it's all volunteers. People who want to be part of the project. They said, well, how about we do this? Or how about I do that? So that was really nice, because then you own it. you know, And that's really important, I think. We had um, some workshops. I put on some workshops. Well, I got people to put them on. I didn't do them um, on archival skills because legal historian um, lawyers are not used to that and history writing. So I actually got in good feminist historians who've written secondary sources to talk about that. We had our workshops to give feedback to make connections between the landmarks, and we tried to group them around subjects. But you could have done it chronologically as well, um, so that you could see how the things all fitted together. We issued some guidelines, very important, to do that right at the start of the project. This is the format we want, and this is the referencing system we're using. So that's all done. And it's really interesting how lots of people can't follow guidelines, <laughs> academics, you know. With these sections, with these, this many words, you know, it's a bit like filling in an application form or a grant application. 
They still couldn't do it. Anyway, they then presented and we sent back the feedback and said follow the guidelines. And so it's going to produce this, this book. There'll be articles and there'll be the website, as I said. And all the, web, the workshops have taken place. We've got our drafts, we've, the presentations, and we've got about 80% of them back, I think. Um, we have the contract with Hart, who's a, a legal um, publisher. And uh, what was nice, actually, out of all of this was, in one of the workshops, the participants said, we'd like to set up a Women's Legal History Network. And it's actually been coordinated by a young man. Um, I was very happy for them to do it, but I'm too busy. And so that's great, because we've now got this network that's hosted by University of Kent. And uh, I felt pleased about that. So here are the guidelines, and then I'm going to finish with taking you through an example, not written by me, but by one of my colleagues, to show you how it works. So these are the, the guidelines basically set out that if you were doing a, an ordinary landmark, like a statute, or, or we had other things that weren't statutes and cases. We had um, Green and Common, for example, which, you know, the peace demonstrations was one. So we have sort of events as well. You had 3,000 words. If you were doing a first woman, like um, first woman um, um, House of Lords judge, Lady Hale, then she gets 2,000 words, although she's the first for almost everything. And she was lovely, actually. I mean, she's always been very, very encouraging of this project, and she's actually writing one of the landmarks, uh, um, as well as being one of the landmarks she's writing. So, which is great. Um, so there's an introduction which is short, and that is what will appear on the website so that people will know what it was, but very, very briefly. Then you have to set the context. This is the challenge for non-historically trained, trained people, because they don't realise that you've actually got to immerse yourself in the period and really understand what's going on in terms of politics, in terms of society, in terms of women's role, education, all that sort of stuff, as well as feminist history. So the context then, as well as explain the law, what's the existing law, what are the movements for change, what's the resist, all of that. Then you talk about the landmark and how it came about. So that's a description of what happened. Then you've got the what happened next, okay, which is all the reactions and the mostly. Well, take Lady Hale, for example. I mean, she, she gets in there, right? And um, there isn't another woman appointed to the House of Lords Supreme Court until this year. So it's sort of 13 years on or something, which is the only woman for all that time. And then finally, the significance. Why is this an animal? Why is this important? Um, and this is the one I've chosen to discuss. And this is my friend Anne Morris, who's at Liverpool. And this is a case called um, Gill and Coote and Elvino, and I thought it would appeal to Australians um, because it's about women who were challenging the rule that you couldn't serve women at the bar. I am old enough to remember when women couldn't go into the public bar in Australia. I remember indeed in my first job in Wollongong that the staff do was held in a golf club that didn't admit women, so I couldn't go. I can't believe that that would happen now. It would, obviously. Don't you remember Mum outside in the car with a shandy and the kids in the back seat while Dad was in the hotel? Is that what it was like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my mother didn't do that, I can tell you. But, um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, so we are talking our lifetime. And this was real. this is great. So you can see this is 1983. Um, and this is the introduction. I mean, these are longer. I'm only taking very short extracts, obviously, because it's a 3,000 word piece. So she says, in this case, two women, a lawyer, Tess Gill, and a journalist, Anna Coote, successfully challenged the rule in Fleet Street. Fleet Street, of course, is, well, I'll tell you, you know, in that wine bar that they couldn't be served. So then we get on to the context. What I love about the way that Anne's written this is, in the 70s, a, there was a judge in, in England called Lord Denning. He was a very famous judge. And he used to write these fabulous judgments that I love our students to read because he would tell a story. I mean, he was, he was, um, he would tell a story to get to to develop his point to justify his choice of law. He was a brilliant law, a brilliant judge. I think the best judge of the 20th century. But you know, he used to always start by saying, "Oh well, in the village of so and so, there the boys mm -hmm. used to get together and play cricket." And, or <laughs> there was a scripture that. meeting in. Can you guess the cases? There was a scripture meeting in uh, Trafalgar Square and. That's, um, those are both property law cases. No, one of them is a tort case. But anyway, so he'd start this way. Well, she's done the same thing. Because this is going to be read by people from all over the world who won't know Fleet Street, which it isn't anymore like this. 
The London thoroughfare of Fleet Street was for many years the hub of the English newspaper industry, and in its many pubs and wine bars, journalists congregated at all hours, even the cadence is very Lord Denningish, I think, um, to drink, socialise, and gossip. Because it runs through London's legal quarter, which includes the Royal Courts of Justice and the Inns of Court, journalists would be rubbing shoulders and exchanging information with members of the legal profession. So she sets the scene, and you can see the journalists and the, and the legal men, mostly men, but these two women as well, all there. And it's really important, that kind of interchange, of course, because that's the way the lawyers sort of start, you know, catch up with the real world. It's the way the journalists get their news stories. So she then goes on to explain the relevant law in, in this case, which was the Sex Discrimination Act, which was passed in 1975. And that was, we do have that as a landmark, and rightly so, because, of course, the women's liberation movement started really in England in 1970. I mean, we had, there was feminism before then, but with um, a meeting which issued four demands, and among those four demands was equal opportunities um, in education and jobs, and uh, equal pay was one, and um, they, were, they were socialist feminist ones. They were the ones that would allow women to compete with men in the workplace generally. So they were along this line, and then, of course, we'd also just joined the EU, the EC as it was then, European Community, and as a result, the sex, we had, the UK had to come into line and pass the Sex Discrimination Act, um, which basically said you can't um, discriminate in, in jobs, education, and the provision of um, services on the grounds of gender, or sex as they called it then, um, or marriage. Okay? So the law says you can't do what they were doing. So she then... Um, describes exactly what happened, how they went up to the bar, how they, they couldn't be served, and so on. And they complained of sex discrimination, contrary to Section 29 of the Act, with the support of the Equal Opportunities Commission, which had been set up. Um, in, the, in the City of London Court, the judge dismissed their claim on the basis that, as a matter of common sense, a reasonable person would not feel less favourably treated <laughs> by not being able to get a drink at the bar. You know, they could get a man to bring them a drink. That would be fine. He added that Coot and Gill had exaggerated their dismay, their reaction being somewhat extreme, given that only a handful of people had objected to the rule. And this is really interesting because this is the kind of reasoning that we're getting from judges when we have a clear law saying you can't do this. Right? And this is so common in the landmarks. The law is passed and the judges can't quite believe what they're reading. And so they don't read it that way. So anyway... This was overturned in the Court of Appeal. I've already explained that Lord Denning was in the Court of Appeal, although I don't think that he was part of this judgment. But the Court of Appeal was, a very, was quite liberal, actually, I think, in this period. And so they won their case. What happened next? Having won their case, the successful claimants repaired, unsurprisingly, to the Vinos for a celebratory drink. They were met by the manager, Paul Bracken, who refused to serve them. Although Mr Bracken was prepared to serve other women, he said he would not serve those who want to make trouble or make a feminist point. Mr. Bracken commented that it was a very sad day for Elvino's, a place where old-fashioned ideals of chivalry still flourish. And this is, this is she's quoting um, from the Times. So, you know, this is, it's a lovely, lovely story, and it takes what was actually a fairly small case um, and shows how symbolically important it was. The significance, I mean, there's quite a lot about the significance, and I think she's picked out some really good points. She says, the Sex Discrimination Act required men and women to be treated equally, and it was no longer acceptable to apply quasi-Victorian notions of women being fragile creatures who needed to be protected or kept out of public spaces. So that's the first thing. Okay, we get rid of chivalry, right? <laughs> um, and there's a principle of equality, sex, sex equality. She then says, exclusionary rules and customs applied by an overwhelmingly male elite. So she names the people who are defending their space. Right? It's not the institution repairing itself and realising that attitudes have changed. It's not. It's actually um, a male elite that's had to be stopped from doing this. In the guise of chivalry towards the fairer sex were recognised, implicitly at least, as a ploy to inhibit women's participation. Of course, because if you couldn't go up to the bar, you might miss the best conversations, the best bits of news, 
um, the best uh, pointers and so on. I mean, it's, it's a bit like the whole business of judges not being able to, to rope together or not being able to drink, to go to the same clubs actually, still in London. Um, the Garrick Club is still closed to women and that's one that many judges belong to. And, and Brenda Hale is, is just finds that really difficult working with men who will defend that because you know she's one of them. She's now the president of the Supreme Court um, and she still can't join the club that, where they have all these conversations. The rejection of the de minimis argument. The de minimis argument is, what's wrong with you? This is just a little thing. It's only you that's complaining. And I don't, those of us who are old enough to remember complaining about sexism or harassment or whistling in the street, I mean, really, what is wrong with you? No sense of humour. It was that rule, that was always put our way. Why do you have to make a fuss about something that really doesn't matter very much? And we still have to do this. So she's, she's commented on this and she's done it in a legal way. The de minimis, it's, it's not worth bothering about rule. In this context, it was important, showing that on occasions, the then as now male-dominated judiciary is willing to address the sexism that, when challenged, often provokes accusations of overreaction and hysteria towards feminist harridans. So I think that's really a very nice point on which to end, um, because it shows you why I think this is a very important project, why it's a fabulous project to be part of, and why I hope what we're doing is not just telling a new women's history, but we're actually writing a new legal history because it doesn't just alter the way we look at women, it alters the way we look at all the things we already study in legal history. So thank you. Questions? We do have a bit of time, so does anybody want to start off with a question for Rosemary? Yes, yes. Um, thanks for Rosemary. And, um, um, I'm returning the favour when you uh, appeared at, 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 uh, to listen to my paper at SLS in Dublin. So I just wanted to make a comment rather than a question to you, and that is you were making some comments about how legal history is taught in um, in, in the UK, and um, I just I guess wanted to reflect on how legal history is taught at Newcastle Law School because um, I do it. <laughs> and one of the things that I think is very exciting uh, because of the way that most of our students are educated in Australia is that they, they do do the double degree. Yeah. So one of the yeah. things that is very exciting teaching legal history to later year law students is that often in the class you will have students who already have an honours degree in history. And so their capacity to, to bring these things together and my own background is obviously as, mm. as a person with, with two strings, two disciplines. So, and, and also I suppose in terms of the institutional top-down thing, one of the things that we do is to look at a lot of um, case studies of law reform in the 19th century and, and individuals who are involved in that. And overwhelmingly, both the male and the female students are looking for what women are doing. Good. And so they're choosing law upon characters who are out of the box, as it were. There are some who will say, you know, William Wilberforce and all this sort of stuff, no yeah, problem yeah, with yeah. that. But let's look at the Quaker women who are also involved in abolition. Let's look at some of these other things. So I'm not sure that the position, well, at our law school, I can't speak for other law school, um, but I think there's a bigger chance in Australia of, of being able to do what you're talking about, yeah. which is to bring together that historical discipline background and, and the legal information and, and really engage with students in ways that are, that are very positive. No, I was so aware that you have joint degrees generally, although not, I understand, everywhere. Um, but, but still, anyway. Yeah, but no, that does make a huge difference. They've got the method. But that said, I think there's still quite a lot of history that's taught without women. Correct me if I'm wrong, historians here. Um, so even though they'll have the method, and you will, I think, encourage them, obviously to look at women and other, you know, non-leaders because of the way you teach. Um, I still think there's quite a lot of history that's written that's very, that's very much public history and institutional history and isn't... For example, what I think with biography, feminist biography, it's not just biographies of women. What we want to do is start looking at the men, going back and looking at the judges and the politicians and so on and say, where are the women in their life? You know, this kind of um, 
you know, they'll say, oh, I couldn't have done this without my wife. Well, they might not say that. But it's no kind of, that's just a kind of gesture. The truth is they couldn't have done it without having a wife, a housekeeper, a mistress, possibly. Um, and what was their attitude to women in the profession or women in a particular, you know? Because once you start uncovering that, you start looking at gender. So I actually think it's, um, you know, I don't know anything about Wilberforce and his wife or his attitudes to women. I do know that the women in the anti-slavery movement weren't actually allowed to have them to speak in the meetings. Um, so I think there was a bit of discrimination going on, and those are the sorts of things. I mean, that is actually meant that's known in history, but I think there's quite a lot that could be done. Um, so in a way, you're kind of you're starting with an advantage over the, most of the people I work. With. Most, of them, not all of them, but most of them, in that they understand historical method, perhaps, or any kind of humanities method actually would help. English or some other subject like that, politics would be fine. But I'm not sure there's women in everything, even now in other forms of scholarship. I, maybe I'm wrong. Like to think I was wrong. I can't. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up to that, that um, when I did my first undergrad, well, when I did my undergrad degree, which was arts law, um, and a degree institution at the University of Melbourne, we actually were forced to do history and philosophy and law in our first year, and I really enjoyed that um, very much. But I do think it's a systemic issue in how people going into into the cohort that I was in privilege law and that kind of positivistic thinking over the social sciences and over arts, you know, I think regularly our arts degrees were actually kind of rubbished in relation to the law because the law already kind of, you know, what to do with like, you know, the kind of exclusive access into doing a law degree, undergrad and that type of thing, it kind of encourages, I think, students who, um, you know, want to make claims to certain privileges to say that way of thinking in the law is also superior to all these other ways we're trained to think in, you know, the social science and humanities. So, that was just a nice No, good. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's helpful when someone because corroborates my thoughts. <laughs> 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 You could draw a bit of a parallel too with women, so women in engineering and that could count you. I mean, when I left school, I don't think any women would find know of yeah. engineering. The subjects they studied, studied at school tended not to be prerequisites for engineering. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can't think of any engineers doing a double degree in humanities as well, or even things like point. Point. history of science. Although I do yeah. recall the first couple of years when I was here when it was New South Wales, engineers, scientists, metallurgists and architects and I had to do a subject called Humanities 1 yeah. and Humanities 2 to, to civilise them, but of course they treated this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the distinction is lawyers are just so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, they really can decide women's fate mm -hmm. in a way that engineers can't. But it is very nice, you know, whenever I meet, I've got a, a, young, a, a young, she's in her 40s, um, engineer friend who's, who's a woman and I know others I've now women quite casually introduced I, I can't imagine at our school can you any girls from girls high becoming oh, engineers you're after Leslie Tyler she oh, became an electrical engineer did she, did she? Yes. she, yes. she did. actually and she was the first uh, female electrical engineering teacher at Tate yeah. in New South Wales so she did end up combining the man, you know, the teaching, yeah, the lecture. Yeah. But yes, yeah. the following year, Rosemary, we were just... Oh, well, there you are. We were, yeah, yeah. So it does always please me when I see it, but it's still, yeah. yeah. Oh, Rosemary, I was very interested to get back to your project. You said that it was working with scholars in Europe as well as the UK. Well, the, the, there are two different ones. Okay. The, the Women's Legal Landmarks is entirely uh, UK and Ireland. Right. But the gender in the legal academy right. is an international project. Yes, and I yeah. was wondering how that, uh, that involvement with scholars from Europe was sort of reframing the way you're looking at law. Yeah, because of course they have very different legal systems. Yes. And yes. indeed, I, one of the things I have to worry about there, and I'm not actually an editor, I just, it's just that I yes. get sent the stuff because she's German and it's being produced in English, you know. God, it's, it's, all these things that make you think, all these people from all over the world are having to write in English. Um, and then we expect them to explain the law, right, because, and the legal situation. The situation of women is different. 
mm. you know, um, the restrictions, the universities were set up at different times, at different, mm. all of that's got to be explained. And then you read something by a British person who assumes that we all know this. It's mm. really awful, awful, mm. awful. And so you have to, in a way, this, that should have had guidelines right from the start. Um, does it? No, I think actually, in terms of women's situation, although the dates might be different, mm. um, some of the personal circumstances are different. What it does is reinforce a story that it's worldwide, actually. That, in general, the legal profession didn't want them and did all it could to keep them out and still, to some extent, makes it very hard for women. Another thing, actually, that I have to pick up all the time is they just say, they assume that we all understand it's hard for women because they have to combine family and work yeah. responsibility. And I just think, no, we aren't automatically family-centred. What about the men? You know. It's if, if it's a problem, it's a problem for both, because yeah. they both have children, they both have families. So why are we always saying it's a problem for women? And yeah, so sometimes you'll find, and sometimes of course, it's harder for people in other countries to make headway. I was thinking, of, I was thinking not so much, uh, I was thinking also of the Scandinavian system, oh, yeah. law, which I have always been led to believe, probably falsely, mm that uh, there had been better opportunities for them in the law in Scandinavia. But yes, no, all I'm, of that is I'm true because not. they did have better family-friendly policies. It doesn't mean that the women got home oh. any better. There still are higher numbers. Okay. Uh, it's not a feminised... Actually, it's interesting that law schools are becoming feminised, I do mm. think. I don't know if this is the case in Australia. Yes. But I think we're getting to the point, certainly students, more students, mm. more women students by far, but getting to the point where we're actually going to have some more women's staff as well. Mm. Um, and that means the profession will go down in stages, of mm. course. Mm. Um, and it's happening in medicine as well. Is it? <laughs> now that is interesting. So then once you start comparing all the professions, it's all the same story. That's why it's got to be told, because mm. it's a first step. Knowledge is a first step. Any other questions? Um, you mentioned uh, green and common. Yeah. Are you able to say what was the legal uh, now that's really quite interesting. Well, I mean, they did achieve quite a lot of. Um, I mean, the base left in the end, and mm. they did. They, they did achieve that. But really, it was interesting because a friend of mine is writing this. Who's um, well, they're all friends now. But I mean, she's actually a barrister who who was, who appeared for the women of Green, Green and Common, and uh, she sees it as a kind of feminist victory in terms of um, solidarity, getting women activists together and really achieving things and but also they used they'd go into court uh, I didn't know all of it, I'd forgotten all this but you know they would they would disrupt courts by singing and so on and the courts had to deal with that and finally she said she became a, a, a barrister because of feminism and that actually enabled her to progress she said a lot of women moved into law as a result of that and that you know it's kind of indirect landmark but it is a landmark that women are associated with, I think. So. Because I, um, Green and Common is just in briefly in one of my chapters for my thesis, leading yeah. up to women in the peace movement mm. in the 70s and 80s, yeah. and the inspiration of Green and Common here. If everyone knows what Green and Common was, I'm not sure. Mm. But um, I looked it up, and I, I think I think it said the the base ended up not because of the camp, the women's camp, it just ended up closing... Well, they always say that. Oh, oh, rubbish. It's like they women got the vote it. because of the war. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be written. You learn to read between the lines. But you have to ask... I mean, and maybe there, there, there are other reasons. But <laughs> they did draw attention to it. So in the end, that publicity, you know, the suffragettes yes, did draw attention to the battle. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's that... Yeah. That's the, you have I to read with your own eye <coughs> Right. <laughs> um, I might just ask one final question, if that's okay. What do you anticipate the reaction or the response to this project being in 2019? Because you, you mentioned the judge in the House of Lords is still mm. not permitted to enter the bar that all the other male. Yeah, well, that's not in the club. Yeah, that's yeah, true. The club, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, what yeah. do you anticipate the reaction will be within the legal profession to? Oh, I think they'll all love it. Officially. <laughs> they'll welcome it. It's really great and they'll take no notice of it.
They won't. Although it's interesting, the Feminist Judgments Project, which was an earlier project I was involved in, I didn't organise it, but Erica was one of the organisers. But I did write a judgment. It's where you take a judgment that's a real one that's happened, that you teach, say, and you rewrite it as if you were the judge, right? And there's been an Australian one, of course, um, and all over the world, actually, now they're doing that. That actually, some people like Brenda Hale, for example, she will actually cite that. I mean, she knows it's not an authority, it's not law, but she will do it. And because she's become more and more and more aggressively feminist, as she's been there, having been, you know, a very polite lady to start with, she's been very polite. I mean, she's not like me, she is but a very polite lady and, and, and a very good lawyer, but she has become much more outspoken. So, I don't know, maybe it will have an effect. It's what we don't actually care about what happens mm. there so much as we want our students and the general public. We want this to become something so that when you Google, for example, mm. and you Google, you won't get great heroines of history. And I'm afraid quite a lot of these projects are a bit still that way. What you get is our site. Mm. And so school kids will be able to get this information. And then they'll get interested and then they'll want to do it at university and then they'll want to do PhDs and write books and so on. So it's we want to empower from below, and that's boys as well as girls. Yeah. Um, and I think that will change things. Yeah. I have to think yeah, that will change things because I'm a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that's fabulous. Thank you. Please join me in the. Uh, thank you. I had a brain. I had a brainstorm this morning. We couldn't leave you with nothing. So, the most exotic thing we have is an artwork by your father that was done in 1968, and we scanned it because I'd never seen anything resembling an artwork from your father before. So this is the most unique thing, and uh, we had a copy made of it. So it's for you. Oh, no, it's not the press. <laughs> This? Yes. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Who says he did? I think my mother probably did. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I did. Well, it's got his name on it, though, maybe. Well, of course! Teddy's fabulous. There's that lovely, I can remember when they were choosing this. Well, we can always assign, assign provenance to your mother if you like. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the tongue on the horse. <laughs> yeah, no, it is very beautiful. It is now, I mean, well. I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. That's all right. I'll have Thank it you framed. very much. Um, it is rather pretty. It is rather lovely. So. There's only three. We had three works come in for some competition that they got them to do. Yeah. Uh, one was from Godfrey Tanner, one from oh, yes. uh, the Chaplain Warren, yeah. and, and your father. And I thought, wow, I've never seen anything like that. Well, then that. he must have done it, really, I suppose. I think so. <laughs> I thought to myself, it's real, it's real crap art, but, you know, I think you'll love it. Maybe it's <laughs> Some woman, anyway. <laughs> I can remember actually helping to do some of the lettering on the original thing myself. Um, so, you know, all these women always rallying around their men. Anyway, thank you. It is That's right. Well, uh, thank you, Jim.